Good morning. morning. And welcome to this week's service at First Presbyterian Church. I would like to, I do this for you, those of you who are sitting here, I do this for the sake of people who are joining this service by internet and don't have a bulletin in front of them. I would like to acknowledge uh, Chuck Jones, who's our liturgist this morning. Uh, Kathleen Schaefer and Crystal Green are leading us in music, and Phil and Tony Vela are back in the AV booth. Just a couple of of notes. Um, The community Lenten services continue. Um, This will be the second week of those services. This week's service is being provided for us by First Baptist Church, and you should be able to find it this evening on um, on Facebook, on the Dakma Community Face Dixon Dakma Community Facebook page, I found the easiest way to find my way to that. If you're looking for it on your computer, is just to go into Google and type Dixon D A C M A Community, and that gets you there as easy as any other way I can tell you to find it. Um, I will also send out that link again with the email with the um, YouTube link later on today. We're working on trying to gradually normalize a few things about Sunday worship. And one of those is trying to get our ushering schedule back onto a little bit more normalcy. So you should have found in your bulletin this morning a little half page insert asking if you are willing and able to usher and offer us some possible dates. For those of us sitting here in the sanctuary, it's really us to do all the things that we normally do on Sunday morning. Um, Ushering has been simplified quite a bit since we're not taking an offering these days. So if you would be essentially willing to greet people at the door as they come in on Sunday morning and um, help with a couple of things uh, before and after the service, um, please just take that, fill it out, put it in the offering plate on your way out, and we will use that information to construct an ushering schedule for the next couple of months. And then I feel a little bit too much like being everybody's mom um, at this point, but I would encourage you to uh, continue to be careful to observe uh, social distancing, um, coming and going, especially going. Uh, The back door is open again, the sidewalk is clear, and so we would encourage you as much as you can to try to exit afterwards and as much as you love to catch up with folks, to catch up with folks from a reasonable distance. Um, following the service today. I was, I was sitting there listening to um, Crystal play that uh, beautiful prelude and uh, trying to clear my mind for this. Um, I don't know about you, but in my life, the, the technical aspects of getting everything done these days are so overwhelming that I find myself really preoccupied with them. And so my prayer for us and myself as we worship is that we will be able to look beyond all of the logistical stuff that we have needed to do, the face masks and the protective barriers and the distancing and all of that, and be present to one another and to God in this hour. Let us worship God.
Please stand as we call ourselves to worship with the words of Psalm 66. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would have not answered. But God God has surely listened listened and and has has heard heard my my prayer. Praise be to God, who has has not not rejected rejected my my prayer prayer or withheld his his love from from me. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you have given us all we need in Jesus to deepen our relationship with you. As we learn to accept your grace, we ask you to move us to use prayer and scripture toward a greater awareness of Christ's example to the world. As we commit to these intentional acts, we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the passion to serve your people in this spiritually hungry world. And through this service, we may lead others to the joy of following Christ's life. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. fallen short of the glory of God, but we have been redeemed by God's grace revealed in Jesus Christ. Trusting in his grace, let us join in confessing our sins. Loving God, you have created us to live in families and communities, yet too often we fail to do our part. We do not take responsibility for our own actions while we point fingers of blame and judgment at others. We shirk the call to bear one another's burdens and grow weary of 
fulfilling the demands of love. Forgive us, Lord. Stir our hearts to follow in the way of Jesus and work for the good of all. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. <clears throat> Through his death and resurrection, our Savior has taken away the burden of our sins. In his name we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. first scripture is from Mark chapter 10 verses 33 through 37. These are words that Jesus is telling his disciples as they walk toward Jerusalem. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and leaders of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Chuck, before you sit down, um, I cut you off a couple of verses too short. You don't have a Bible in front of you. Do you? I do. Okay. Verses 38 and 39. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Continue. Continue. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant. And James and John, with James and John, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thank you. Lord.
Listen now to this from the sixth chapter of Galatians. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think that they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must also share in all good things with the teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will, re you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Let's pray. Spirit of God, Spirit of truth, lead us into the truth of this word. Amen. It has often been observed that many of Paul's letters come in two parts. We might call the first part theory and the second part practice. In Galatians, that turning point comes at the beginning of chapter 5. For four chapters, Paul argues his case that we have been reconciled with God not through works of the law, but through God's grace revealed in Jesus Christ, a gift received by faith. And then in chapter 5, he begins teaching about how we are to live as people set free in Christ. He says that living this new life isn't a matter of following more rules and regulations. It's a life of freedom led by the Holy Spirit. He's quick to admit that this isn't as easy as it sounds. Our new life continues to be a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The old ways of the world, distorted by the presence of sin, constantly try to reassert themselves. Our old ways of thinking and living across the whole, whole spectrum of our experience have taken deep root within us. And like the weeds that keep trying to come back in my lawn every spring, they're not easy to eradicate. We overcome these things as we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, allowing the Spirit to bear the good fruit of love, joy, peace, and all the rest. Paul is still far from giving us a how-to manual for this new life in the Spirit. I think this may be because he doesn't want to replace one rule book with another. But in today's reading, he does fill in more of a framework for living in Christ. And the key word that ties this passage together is accountability. Here in Galatians 6, this accountability takes two forms. The first is the accountability that comes from living in a community of the Spirit. In this ongoing struggle of the flesh and the Spirit, we need each other. And now I'm going to violate a cardinal rule of preaching and divide this first form of accountability into two parts. Paul just mentions one of them in passing in verse 6, where he makes a comment about those who teach the word. Our connection to a community in which the word of God is proclaimed and taught by faithful and reliable teachers is a key component in walking faithfully in the spirit. 
sometimes going to that Bible study to read Romans for the 20th time, or listening to a pastor retell the stories we've heard for a lifetime might seem unnecessary. But we all need to be called back constantly to the story that tells us who we are. The absence of that faithful instruction is one reason why Christians become like Paul's opponents in Galatia, who distorted the gospel into something that wasn't good news at all. Preachers and teachers also need a community of peers and scholars and theologians for the same reason. And as Paul says in verse 6, the church needs to share in all good things with them to enable our teachers and preachers to do their good work. Paul's main emphasis, though, is on our accountability to each other. He sets up a hypothetical situation in which a brother or sister in Christ is, quote, detected in a transgression. The wording is awkward here, but Paul isn't envisioning Christians spying on each other or trying to catch each other or judge each other. Neither is he setting out some sort of formal process of church discipline. In fact, our formal processes of discipline aren't really able to accomplish what Paul intends here very well. I've shared before that beginning in 2019, I was part of a group that was asked to investigate accusations of misconduct against a pastor in our presbytery. One third of our book of order is called the Rules of Discipline. And more than any other part of our Constitution, it is a rule book. In its preamble, it recognizes that a primary goal of our process is to bring members to repentance and restoration, and that discipline should be exercised as a dispensation of mercy and not wrath. But it also recognizes that all participants in a judicial process are to be accorded procedural safeguards and due process. And so we have 60 pages, give or take, of very detailed rules governing these safeguards and processes. In working within that structure, it often feels like there's not a whole lot of room left for the Holy Spirit to maneuver, for that repentance and restoration to take place it begins feeling much more like a dispensation of wrath than of mercy. Because of this, it's significant that Paul begins this chapter by addressing his readers literally as brothers. For the sake of trying to make the language more inclusive, the New Revised Standard Version translates this as my friends. And for some reason that word friend actually resonates with me in a way that gets us closer to Paul's point. What Paul envisions here is that we all need friends in Christ. We need someone in our life with whom we can have honest conversations about our lives, about our relationship with God, and yes, even our attitudes and behaviors. In many ways, Laurie acted in that role for me. At the beginning of our marriage, we made some basic commitments in our approach to money and possessions. And Laurie was the one, more often than not, who kept me on track. She was always more generous by nature than I am. And she was quicker to write a check or give an extra gift beyond our planned giving and make me wonder how generous am I really in my own heart. And she also had a way of gently calling into question whether I really needed to buy that extra book or gadget. Jim Olson has also become a friend like this, and I've missed our frequent deep conversations over coffee that have gone by the wayside through this long time of the pandemic. But Paul says we need relationships like this, 
We need to have people in our lives to whom we are accountable. And he says that we need to do such things with gentleness and humility, recognizing that we are also subject to temptation and that we too are engaged in the same struggle of spirit and flesh. To have a friendship like this requires a willingness to be vulnerable. I had a friend back in New York whose day job was as a teacher. She was also a lay preacher in our presbytery. And as time went on and she became more at home in that role, she began to speak quite openly about her lifelong struggle with bipolar disorder. She told me once that she had an arrangement at work. She had given her principal permission to keep an eye on her. And at any time it seemed necessary in his judgment, whether she said she was okay or not, he was to call her husband and have him take her home. This is perhaps a model for the kind of spiritual friendship Paul invites us into. One where we are willing to let other people share our struggles and burdens with us. This kind of friendship is part of what is involved in bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. But it also flies in the face of our individualism. It sees belonging to the church as really being part of a community, not just a name or as a formality, but as something which is actually much more like a family of God. In a way that may seem like a paradox, Paul pairs this with a second kind of accountability. In verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. And in verse 5, he says, each one should carry their own load. We are to be accountable to each other. But at the same time, we are always accountable for ourselves before God. Paul writes in verse 4, all must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. In other words, we should always be more concerned about what we are doing than what other people are doing. And more specifically, the standard for this is what God expects of us. Paul warns against a false sense of pride that we can gain by comparing ourselves with others. But rather than priding ourselves on as seeming more righteousness, sorry, rather than priding ourselves on seeming more righteous than our neighbors or those other people, we should consider how far we have come and still have to go in becoming like Christ. We should celebrate our victories and progress in our life in Christ. But we should celebrate them on those terms, not by comparing ourselves to others. We can also flip this the other way. We can also use comparing ourselves to others as an excuse. There's a phenomenon that people in the media call whataboutism. We see it played out in the political arena all the time. Some powerful person is called out for their bad behavior or hypocrisy. And they get in front of the microphones and they say, maybe I did something wrong, but what about that other person? They're at least as bad as I am. So maybe you should go easier on me and harder on them. And don't we do that in our own lives as well? Teenagers who say, well, everybody else is doing it. It can't be that bad. Or, really, I'm not as bad as those other people. I must be okay. But the standard to which we are accountable before God is the law of love and the example of Jesus. And when it comes to our final examination before God, as it has often been said, God doesn't grade on a curve we will be called to account before God on our own merits or lack thereof. 
And so we are called to live this way in the Spirit, caring for each other and tending to ourselves. We need each other on this journey. If we're truly interested in making progress on the journey of faith, we can't go it alone. And at the same time, we also need to examine ourselves and take responsibility for our own spiritual health. This is a lot. And Paul recognizes this too. And so he ends with this exhortation. And I will end with it too. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Amen. Let's pray. As we do, I should, well, would like to mention a couple of things, uh, words that I've received uh, from our friends in Kenya. Um, a pastor that I know in Kenya named Samuel and his wife are mourning the death of Alice's parents, both of whom passed away within a few days of each other recently. And on the joy side, I received an email from our friend Joseph this week with pictures of that new roof at Kiamatheu Church. And I will get those out and up and projected for us next week. He reports that they are back to worshiping more or less normally now with social distancing and, and everything else. Um, it's been encouraging to see that um, COVID has not spread in Kenya in the same way that it has here in the US and that it's actually relatively safer to live there now than it is here. It was encouraging to hear from Samuel and from, and from Joseph. Now let us pray. Loving God, you have called us into community in Christ. Help us to grow into deeper relationships with each other, that we might be helpers and guides as we seek to follow in the steps of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for signs of growth and progress, for the good report about the, the roof in, in Kenya, for things that we see in our own lives and around us, children growing and flourishing and learning, people taking on new challenges, We thank you for this season of Lent, for the opportunities and framework that it provides for us to examine ourselves, to get back on track in our lives in those places where we have drifted, to spend time marveling at the wonders of your grace. We thank you for friends near and far, even in the constraints that we've been living with. We thank you for those who love us and pray for us and support us and share their lives and time with us. We do want to pray this morning for Samuel and Alice as they mourn the deaths of two family members so close together in time. And we pray this morning for two of our dear family members here, Ruth Miles and Jan Mitchell, who are living in nursing homes and we haven't seen in way too long. And we pray for other loved ones of ours who are struggling in different ways who need healing and help. We thank you for those who are teachers of the word in your church, Sunday school teachers and pastors and mentors and youth leaders and the whole host of people 
who teach us the way of Jesus. And we pray for neighbors south of us in our country as people in the south still try to recover from the, the severe weather of a couple of weeks ago. And we remember people scattered here and there in our country and around the world who may be months or years behind some sort of catastrophe, but are still working on putting their lives together again. We pray that we would not forget them in the rush of the news from the next day. We pray for refugees around the world, for those trying to find places where they can be safe. We pray with thanksgiving that more of us are getting vaccinated all the time and pray that we might continue to make progress, that through perseverance in doing good, we might collectively as communities and nations be able to overcome this challenge. We offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Fill us with your love, 
May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.